Special thanks to our amazing Stage Door patrons. Defunct Land, LAZTM Productions, Julian Dean, Ethan, Nate Gardner, Noxie Zabat, Brent Black, Riley McMacken, and Tommy Kindle. There are two important components that are necessary for creating a cult. A charismatic force and a community built around it. While most people envision a cult as a group of people dancing around a dead animal, or Charles Manson dancing around a confused reporter, one can actually find the characteristics of cults among different forms of everyday pop culture. The charismatic force is a certain form of media, whether it be a movie, TV show, or book series, and the community are the fans who discuss it religiously online and who buy the merchandise from their local Hot Topic. This cult-like following has become the driving force of the Evil Dead franchise. And in 2006, the bloody, hardcore horror series would make the next logical step in the continuation of its gory legacy. An off-Broadway musical. The most mystifying aspect isn't that this show exists, but more so how it came to fruition from the minds of four college graduates who simply wanted to make a name for themselves and in doing so, would effectively redefine the theater-going experience. Get your ponchos ready. This is gonna be a bloody good time. Legend has it that it was written by the young ones. Necromusicon ex mortis. Roughly translated, the musical of the dead. The show served as a passageway to the niche worlds beyond. It was written long ago, when squirt guns ran red with blood. It was this blood that was used to stage the show, but in the year 2007 AD, the musical disappeared. Scary Movies From Alfred Hitchcock to Jordan Peele, they've held a fascination with moviegoers who want to experience fear, but in a safe environment, where they don't have to worry about being trapped in a house with Michael Myers, or wear a bikini while running through the woods. Trust me, it's not as fun as it sounds. When making scary movies, there's a traditional school of thought among filmmakers that the best kind of horror is that which can't be seen. Tim Burton agreed with this belief, as he strove to showcase the emotional content of the terror as opposed to obscene displays of blood and gore. Sam Raimi, on the other hand, the creator of Evil Dead, did not. And then um, we found there was a third law, and that is that you must taste blood to be a man. You've got to go through this, uh, in these horror films, this, uh, coming of age uh, through this, this blood experience. The original Evil Dead was a horror film that basically said, hey Hitchcock, you can keep your cherry chocolate syrup. You know what'll really scare audiences? A pencil to the ankle, that's what. Raimi, only in his third semester of college and wanting to break into the film industry, decided to attempt to make a movie that defied the conventional belief systems of scary movies, by bringing to life a horror film that would be unlike anything audiences had seen before. It would indulge in extremely grotesque gore and over-the-top mayhem. So basically, it would be like the Three Stooges. A really offensive, dark Three Stooges, with zombies and possessed elk. But when investors saw the film, the scenes were so outlandish and the violence was so extreme that they actually accused Raimi of making a comedy. What's most interesting in the progression of the Evil Dead trilogy is that with each new installment, it proceeded to get more and more ludicrous. 
The series started as a B-movie slasher film, centered around five college kids in a cabin in the woods trying to survive against demons, and ended as a medieval epic that found the main character Ash trying to defeat an army of unemployed Halloween Town taxi drivers while trying to acquire the Necronomicon, or the Book of the Dead. The most insane film in the series, however, was Evil Dead 2, which is where Sam Raimi decides to go full Sam Raimi, and leads one to wonder how the man who directed this... Hello, lover. ...was the same person who would direct... this. Originally released in 1987, it wouldn't be until 2001 that a VHS copy of the film would find itself in the hands of a stage and screen major named Christopher Bond. Watching the movie, he saw it as more than just a cheap slasher flick. It was a powerful epic of one man versus his environment. He fell in love with the idea of the hero versus a log cabin. After graduating from Queen's University, Bond was in the familiar situation that many art majors find themselves in, wanting to work, but not being able to get hired due to a lack of experience. Having limited options, Bond made the ambitious decision that if no one was going to hire him, then he was going to stage his own show and hire himself. Literally anyone can do theater. Now they might not do it well, but nevertheless, there's always a way to do it. All it takes is a published script, a fee to secure the rights, and a space to perform. This is the simplest route, and it's a route that Bond never even considered. In his mind, the only option for putting on a show would be to create something entirely new. After being involved in a production of the Rocky Horror Show, he had been blown away by the cult following that the show had amassed. The majority of people who were coming to see it were people who never had any reason to see live theater. The experience left him with the thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do the same thing? If we could write our own show and create our own cult following? He started to ponder different films that had an underground audience who would hopefully embrace a theatrical adaptation. Comedy writer George Reinblatt was in a similar position as Bond. They had met during a college production of A Chorus Line. He too was having a difficult time getting his name out there. When looking at the two together, it's obvious why they both enjoyed being around each other. They both possessed a calculated anything goes mentality with a partiality towards the madcap and the ridiculous. An original plan that was played around with briefly was a Pulp Fiction musical, but everything changed after Bond got his hands on a VHS copy of Evil Dead 2. He knew as soon as he saw it that that was the film they needed to adapt. The only problem was, Ryan Platt felt that there wasn't enough story, and honestly, he wasn't wrong. Evil Dead 2 has about five minutes of exposition before the wheels completely fall off and it becomes essentially a high-paced comedy of errors. Literally over the course of two minutes, Ash gets his hand possessed, gets beaten up by it, and is then forced to cut it off with a chainsaw. Not exactly gone with the wind, but Reinblatt had a solution. What if they added the plot and characters from Evil Dead 1 and then did something that had never been done before in the theater world. Base a musical on multiple movies. Then they even added a few nods to the third film, Army of Darkness, to really appeal to the hardcore Evil Dead fans. The creative team would simply consist of a ragtag group of graduates from Queen's University in Canada. Bond, Reinblatt, and composers Frank Cipolla and Melissa Morris. There were no suits sitting around a stuffy boardroom trying desperately to figure out how they could please their investors, but rather just a bunch of friends sitting around their apartments with a few cold ones trying to figure out how they could make their show as fun as it could be. And while none of them expected the show to be more than just a few performances, Ryan Blatt remembered a one-man show called Mac Homer getting shut down by The Simpsons, and as a result, really wanted to make sure that The Evil Dead show was official. And in order to do that, they needed the rights. Pull up any Broadway season calendar from the past 15 years and there's bound to be at least one musical based on a film. Especially today, it's become commonplace to have stage adaptations of popular television shows and movies. Back in 2002, however, 
this wasn't the case. The theater world still indulged in creating original works. And by original, I mean adapting books that nobody took the time to read. I never learned to read! <laughs> the act of adapting a movie to the stage wasn't unheard of, with previous productions like Gigi, The Producers, and Hairspray, but it definitely wasn't as commonplace as it is now. This left Reinblatt wanting to secure the rights for Evil Dead, but having no idea who to ask to make it a reality. Digging around on the internet, he was able to find the professional email of the man who brought Ash to life, and the man who was the best part of the Spider-Man 2 video game, Bruce Campbell. Well, I'm not sure how you managed to die. I mean, seriously, unless you're a professional game tester, there's no reason for you to be dying yet. Campbell was extremely supportive of the project, and got Reinblatt in touch with the parties necessary for acquiring the rights. Evil Dead was basically a defunct film franchise, and since the show would be taking place in Canada, the studio essentially just gave the crew their approval to do their thing without fear that they would be coming after them. They were able to secure a one-off, seven-show agreement to stage the production that they were now calling Evil Dead 1 and 2 The Musical. A shoestring budget of $5,000 resulted in a charmingly modest production that was to be staged at a small local bar in Toronto called the Transact Club. The set was made from the wood of an old barn, tickets were only $17, and since this was before the internet was widely accessible, seats were reserved by calling a hotline to get placed on the will call list and then paying at the door. It was a few hours before the bar would open. They had over 100 reservations on their list, with others waiting for cancellations. And just as a lighting designer was screwing in one of the last stage lights, the power went out. Not only for their theater, but for the entire eastern seaboard. Good evening from our NBC News headquarters in Midtown Manhattan, where we are in the midst of what appears to be a colossal and history-making blackout. The blackout of 2003. After a night without light, power still out for millions. Travel is very difficult. Phone service shaky. When will it end? On the opening night of Evil Dead the Musical on August 14th, 2003, Christopher Bond found himself trapped in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on his usually mellow route. Confused about what was going on, he turned on the radio to hear that a massive power failure in Akron, Ohio had resulted in a massive blackout. When he got to the Transact, he found himself faced with the difficult decision of how to put on a musical without any power. The cast was in costume, and nearly 100 people were lined up waiting to see the show. He took a second to assess the situation, before he remembered that there was a small lawn area outside of the bar. Inventive innovation took a hold of the cast and crew as they sought to bring the show to life on the bar's exterior. Jeep headlights were used as spotlights, the crew played their instruments acoustically, and any blood effects came from squirt guns. Having nothing to do because of the blackout, people were out and about walking around. Seeing the crowd that had gathered and hearing the music, they decided to peek their heads in and see what was going on. What could have easily killed the show before it even had a chance to debut? The inventive decision to carry on proved to be its biggest blessing. By the end of the impromptu outdoor performance, the positive word of mouth began to run wild. And within the next few weeks, the number of people they had to turn away at the door was only fueling the public interest in seeing just what all the buzz was about. It was gaining so much steam that they were actually able to convince the studios to help them extend the run by three weeks. Around this same time, George Reinblatt had gotten an internship with Just for Laughs, one of the largest international comedy festivals in the world, and was suddenly finding himself among the elites of his profession writing jokes for celebrities like Tina Fey and Kelly Ripa. Reinblatt decided to invite people from Just for Laughs to attend, as well as his old camp counselor, Jeffrey Latimer, whose work up to this point included producing shows like Forever Plaid, and more importantly, Michael Buble's first commercial show, Forever Swing. Get it? The experience was a very different one for him. He was used to producing feel-good shows that had mainstream appeal, and now, here he was watching a human head get cut in half by a chainsaw. He still found himself walking away with the feeling that it was one of the best nights of his life. 
falling in love with the silliness of the show and how it could appeal to audience members of all ages. Because nothing says, kids night, quite like severe mutilation. The Just For Laughs team felt the same way. And as a result, they offered the show the chance to move from the small, confined back room of the Transact Club to the far-reaching, majestic stage of their 2004 comedy festival in Montreal. Groovy. The Just for Laughs Festival was once described as the Coachella of comedy, which is absolutely ridiculous because the chances of getting chlamydia there are a lot higher. Think of it as the Sundance of comedy with fans and industry professionals alike flocking to Montreal to see the next big thing in comedy. All of a sudden, the creative team had a budget to start paying everyone involved, and a much bigger performing space. With the increase in the venue size, they still brought the same set from the Transac. This meant that the production team needed to figure out how to solve a problem that had been popping up in the previous run. Now, the original Evil Dead films were covered with more blood than Carrie White on prom night. And when bringing the films to life on stage, the blood element was always an important aspect for the production team. The problem was, they noticed that the blood had a tendency to accidentally shoot off the stage and inevitably spray a couple of the front row tables in the process. With every effort to try to figure out how to solve the issue, nothing was working. And eventually, they just decided that instead of wasting more time trying to figure out a way to keep it on the stage, it would be a lot easier to just designate the first two tables as a blood zone. Figuring that nobody would be crazy enough to voluntarily want to get blood on themselves, the tickets were offered at a discounted rate as a way to thank the crowds for their willing sacrifice. But as the show continued, people actually weren't avoiding the blood zone. If anything, they were fighting to get into it and were actually complaining that they weren't getting hit. Running with this feedback in Montreal, and still not having a way to avoid the blood flying off the stage, the crew decided to create a small section of the crowd that would be dedicated to getting shot with the blood mixture during certain moments of the second act. At the time, it wasn't a big deal to them, as they just decided, uh, just let the blood happen. By the time their first performance at the Just For Last Festival arrived, the ragtag group of college friends prepared themselves for the next step in the show's journey. A step that none of them would have dreamed of happening, and probably one that many of them thought would be the pinnacle of the show's success. Though the first month of ticket sales was decent, they started to notice an upward trend. Just like in Toronto, the buzz began to spread. In what was probably the biggest sign in the early 2000s that the show was gaining serious comedic traction, the cast and crew looked out into the crowd and saw none other but Drew Carey sitting in the front row. Within no time, Evil Dead once again gained the positive traction among audiences, and it was soon the hottest act of the festival. If Just For Laughs truly was Coachella, then Evil Dead was Tupac's hologram. The positive reception from the show caught the attention of many producers, and soon the creative team found themselves in multiple meetings with multiple different avenues that the show could go. Out of all of the offers, they were most drawn to producer Bill Franzblau, who had a clear-cut plan for where the show needed to be. Partnering up with Jeffrey Latimer, Just For Laughs Live, and Bill Franzblau, Evil Dead 1 and 2, the little musical that had started in the back room of a dimly lit bar, would now be moving to the bright lights of New York City for an official off-Broadway run. The New World stages would become the birthing ground of shows like Heathers, Alter Boys, and most impressively, Mad Libs Live. But in 2006, it was still finding its footing as an off-Broadway house, after having been renovated from a multiplex movie theater two years prior. Evil Dead the Musical would become the second show housed in their 499-seat Stage 1 theater. With Franz Blau coming on board, Evil Dead now had the advantage of a strong producer who was going to take the production to the next level. Work with touring productions of Beatlemania and, surprisingly, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles helped equip Franz Blau with the development of a strict system that could assure a high-quality production. 
His cardinal rule of leading by example through calmness, collaboration, and a general desire of having the most fun with the show as possible made him the perfect fit for the Evil Dead family. Even though Evil Dead could have easily been written off as a cheap musical that relied on the fact that the audience got sprayed with blood, Franz Blau saw the potential that the show held. He refused to settle for anything but the best when it came to the off-Broadway creative team, bringing in set designer David Gallo, fresh off his Tony win for Drowsy Chaperone, Emmy Award winner and current Saturday Night Live makeup artist Louis Zakarian to bring the zombies to life, and the esteemed B.H. Barry from the Royal Shakespeare Company to serve as a fight choreographer. In terms of direction, while Bond had proved that he was extremely capable in bringing the show to life, it was still his first show, and the producers weren't fully prepared to hand over the keys to the off-Broadway Oldsmobile. Instead, a collaboration was set up, with Tony Award winner Hinton Battle, who would be a co-director. Having the creative team in place, the attention was then turned towards the cast. While the original team was willing to compromise for the most part, there was still one major point of contention when it came to the casting. Who would be playing the role of Ash? The role of Ash Williams is an extremely difficult role to cast due to the certain earnest machismo that Bruce Campbell brought to the table. In the same way that Michael Sarah has gone on to be typecast as the quiet, awkward geek, Bruce Campbell perfectly embodies the cheesy, quick-witted swashbuckler. Bond and Reinblatt knew that Campbell defined Ash, and they were extremely worried that they wouldn't be able to find someone who could capture that same essence, while also making the role their own. But before their first production at the Transact Club in Toronto, they had one person show up to auditions who wasn't one of their friends. His name was Ryan Ward, and right from the get-go, it was apparent that he was their Ash. They were steadfast in their belief that Ward was the only person who could play the role in the off-Broadway production, but the producers weren't sold. They were convinced that they could find a New York actor that could bring the same charisma to the role. Still, being willing to compromise, Ward was given the opportunity to fly down and audition. For four days, they auditioned multiple actors for the role. And in the end, no one even came close to the energy that Ward possessed. Even though he was soft-spoken offstage, when it was showtime, he was able to dial the energy up to 11. At decision time, the team laid it all on the line and stated bluntly to the producers that they had bought the show because they liked Ward. Without his version of Ash, there would be no show. The producers relented, and Ward's journey with Evil Dead would continue. Everything was falling into place, and luck was proving to be on their side once again. Gallo was a huge Evil Dead fan and created an updated set design that featured many of the key elements from the Transact Club while also making it more badass. The hero's journey of man versus his environment that Bond had originally fallen in love with while watching Evil Dead 2 was brought to the stage with an enhanced theatricality that was still able to retain its intimacy by making the audience feel like they were actually in the cabin with the characters. Also updated was a pneumatic blood system that would guarantee a good dousing of a section of the audience that they now referred to as the splatter zone. It became a dance between the performers and the operators of the system, since the special formula was non-toxic, machine washable, and glycerin based, meaning that it was tremendously slippery. Another major change that came with the off-Broadway show had to deal with the ending. Since the musical was originally titled Evil Dead 1 and 2, the musical found itself ending the same way as the Evil Dead 2 movie. In what is probably the most oddball swerve that would make M. Night Shyamalan jealous, Ash finds himself pulled through a portal after thinking that he's defeated the Deadites, and instead is transported back to medieval times. Now, where the film series gets a third movie to explain why this happened, the stage adaptation didn't get this luxury, leaving audiences confused. The creative team wasn't that enthused about the ending either. They felt that the musical lacked a big show-stopping final number to send the crowds home happy. Having seen the musical Hairspray, they had fallen in love with the song You Can't Stop the Beat and decided that the ending needed to evoke those same feelings. 
After a workshop, they decided to use the ending from Army of Darkness, which instead finds Ash at S-Mart as he recalls his journey to medieval times and everyone thinks he's crazy. Then a deadite comes to life and he promptly kicks its ass. This would be the perfect ending to the show, and they would finally be able to add their hairspray style ending with a musical number titled, You Blew That bitch Away. When it came time for opening night on November 1st, 2006, audiences buckled up for an experience unlike anything seen in the theater world before. I thought the show was outrageous. Uh, good outrageous. You know, you go to a musical, musical comedy or just a musical and you go along with it, it's kind of fun, you have a few laughs, but this is really meant to be balls out entertainment. From start to last, really, it's high energy, if you sit in the first four rows, something horrible will probably happen to you. And I think, hopefully, that's the reason why people will come. You know, one week they'll see Blue Man Group, and next week they'll come and get covered with blood. It's just, there's, uh, takes all kinds to fill the freeways, you know? Instead of trying to present itself as a polished, refined piece of dramatic literature, the show doubled down on the fact that it was, instead, meant to be a party. As opposed to the tradition of getting dressed in fancy suits and sitting silently in an elegant theater, Evil Dead encouraged its audiences to get rowdy and to yell. Basically, if Broadway was the first class dining room of the Titanic, then Evil Dead was the Irish dance party in the third class deck. Crowds went nuts for the show, in part because for one of the first times in New York theater history, the audience was actually allowed to drink in their seats. The mixture of the alcohol, blood, and incredibly off-kilter musical numbers like What the F*** Was That? created a theatrical experience that was unique in the way that it was almost an anti-musical. They didn't take it too seriously, and lovingly poked fun at the horror movie genre and the musical theater genre. Usually, reviews take a few days to appear after opening a show. But Christopher Bond and Frank Cipolla learned that one would actually be out that night, and from the New York Times no less. They were filled with nervous anticipation as they read, Evil Dead the Musical wants to be the next Rocky Horror Show, and it just may succeed. The mix of songs and different styles proved to be an irresistible, irreverent mixture of meta-aware comedy and the rousing number, Do the Necronomicon, drew a cheerful comparison to the time warp. Bond was all smiles. To him, that was all he needed to let him know that the show was a success. He had gone from sitting in a classroom, wanting to evoke the same feelings of Rocky Horror, to standing on a street in Manhattan with the New York Times telling him that his show was its successor. It was a critical success. Commercially, it ran fairly steady, but was never able to bust the doors down. Now, it was always going to be hard to sell people on the idea of Evil Dead not being a horror show. I mean, the name doesn't exactly conjure up the warm, fuzzy feelings of Frozen. Add in the fact that it opened in winter, a notoriously difficult time for sales off-Broadway, and slowly but surely, the crowds in the house began to get smaller and smaller. In the middle of February, Jennifer Bryan arrived at the theater with a feeling of dread. She had received an email saying, 15 minutes before call, meet us in the green room. When she arrived, she was surrounded by the entire team. Stage managers, run crew, actors, and the producers. They made the announcement that after a five month run, Evil Dead would be closing. And so on February 17th, Evil Dead closed after 126 performances and 34 previews. After closing off Broadway, the show packed up and moved back to the city where it had all started, Toronto. It was staged at the Diesel Playhouse and went on to become a mainstream hit, becoming the longest running Canadian production in the city in over 20 years. The show continued to win over audiences with its irreverent charm, and as of 2020, there have been over 500 productions of the show staged around the globe, including a high school version. The beautiful thing is that the show will never be finished. 
Nearly 20 years since work began on Evil Dead, the team is still heavily involved in the show. Bond now directs the national tours for Evil Dead, where the show has grown from playing to a small crowd of 100 people a night, to now playing at capacity for over 2,000 seat theaters. Sepola recorded a backing track of the score and now licenses it to local productions. And all these years later, Reinblatt is still working on the script, constantly updating out-of-date pop culture references. Just like the Deadites, Evil Dead could not die. Well, actually, Deadites could die. They were basically useless, but you get the point I was trying to make. Just like the films, Evil Dead the Musical is very polarizing. It unashamedly broke all the rules of what traditional theater productions look like by creating a show that was an honest-to-god party experience, where people could get roaring drunk, get drenched with blood, and above all else, have an immense amount of fun. Did an Evil Dead musical need to happen? Of course not. But when looking at the films to adapt into stage productions, it really does make a lot of sense. The Evil Dead franchise thrives on over-the-top humor and exaggeration that makes the action feel like it's barely being held within the confines of the screen. By bringing that same energy to the stage, where everything is heightened, the Evil Dead story becomes even more visceral and dramatic. Much in the same vein as Alex Timbers when he approached Beetlejuice, the stage adaptation needed to heighten the over-the-top, anything-goes environment that defined the Evil Dead universe. And in presenting that blood-drenched gore party to the world, it was always going to be difficult to pull in a traditional theater audience in New York. That's not to say that the show is a failure, however, because it isn't, by any means. I mean, a show doesn't just debut its cast album six months after its run is finished and rank it number four on the Billboard musical chart. Off-Broadway and Broadway shows have different lifespans. While a five-month run might not seem like that much time on the Great White Way, five months off-Broadway is a very impressive run. But it still begs the question of what would have happened if the show had moved to Broadway? The answer is, nobody knows. But in my opinion, I think it would have gone the same way as an American Psycho, where it would have struggled to find its crowd. But the more important question is, did it really need to go to Broadway? The answer to that is, it didn't. And I think that it actually made the smarter move by going the off-Broadway route. On Broadway, there are lots of expectations riding on the success of a show. Millions and millions of dollars are poured into the productions, and the need to recoup those costs often results in shows being less willing to take big risks and compromise their vision for money. Honestly, that's the whole reason that Off-Broadway was created in the first place. Seeing the domination of commercialized musicals that lack any real substance, Off-Broadway was a place for the artists to display the works that went against the grain and that would give them a feeling of freedom. By going to the New World stages, Evil Dead was able to capitalize on attracting a strong, dedicated fan base of niche fans who might have never gone to the theater otherwise. They were able to become the charismatic force that in turn was able to create the cult-like community that they had envisioned at the start. It wasn't a show meant for the Broadway elite. It was designed for people who want to have a night of entertainment, blood, and fun. Instead of riding off into the sunset after New York, Evil Dead the Musical continued to follow the amazing trajectory of garnering the strong cult-like following around the globe. Fans of the movie and the musical took the show and made it their own, adding in their own unique twists, including everything from a completely digital version, to the Vegas Strip, to small towns in Oregon, to a smash hit in Korea. Evil Dead the Musical is a prime example that theater isn't defined by geography. It's defined by the power to spark conversation and in creating experiences that audiences will never forget.